Got it. Okay, super. So let's go. Let's let's start speaking about uh, the the dating that's been done thus far. Um, and uh, I mean, we a number of early or Hejazi manuscripts have been dated, uh, including the Sanaa Palimpsest. Um, the Paris manuscript is another famous one, which actually inclu uh, includes, I think, different manuscripts within it. So, um, uh, and in fact, I believe that the the leaves from Birmingham which caused quite a stir at the time that um, our colleague Alba Fideli worked on, um, are actually originally part of that same collection from the Paris manuscript. Um, so yeah, could you speak a little bit about the dating? There's been lots of uh, conversation over some really, really early dates um, that have um, been uh, given both for Paris and for, um, for the Senna. Uh, yeah, could you speak to this? I don't know if you have the date ranges at at hand, um, but even if just generally what the date date ranges are like and how confident we can be in them. Yes. So, uh, in terms of you know the earliest manuscripts that we have that have been radiocarbon dated. So you mentioned the Birmingham fragment, which also has some leaves in Paris. So it would be above three twenty eight C, belong to the same codex. Um, and then we also have, you know, the Sana'a Palms test has been radiocarbon dated. We have other uh, Hejazi manuscripts from Sana'a. So DAM, you know, uh, 29, so 01, 29, 1, uh, 25 has also been radiocarbon dated. And then we have some other manuscripts from the Fustat, the uh, Amr ibn As mosque collection. Um, so I think Arab 330G, the leaves, I think, in, in, in Leiden have been radiocarbon dated. Uh, and then the Chester Beatty manuscript 1615 sorry, uh, has also been radiocarbon dated. And one thing, I, I, so to give credit where credit is due, so the Corpus Chronicum project has really um, done a phenomenal job at pushing the envelope in terms of gaining access to these manuscripts, collecting samples and getting them, uh, getting them dated and publishing those dates for all of us to basically see. So uh, um, they have really been at the forefront of driving uh, systematic radiocarbon dating of early manuscripts. So with that being said, the, ear the earliest dates we have uh, on manuscripts are number one, you know, the Birmingham uh, fragment, number two, um, the Sun Apalimcest, number three, the Chester Beatty manuscript, but those results aren't published yet. It was presented at, at, at a conference, and so I'll kind of reserve any comments on that. And number four, okay. um, the uh, Arab 330, 330G, so the other manuscript from uh, from Fustat. Fustat. So, yes, um, the general range they fall under is somewhere, you know, let's say from like roughly 600 to 650, something something in that range. Um, now, for the now, okay, one now one thing that's that's important to understand. So, how does one go about interpreting these results? So, the first thing is, well, you know, when did the Uthmanic project take place? If we are to say that these manuscripts are part of, are descendant from the Uthmanic text type, um, when did this project happen? Um, setting aside the palm cess because that's a different text type. The other ones, well, you know, the the general date that is used both, you know, in let's say the East and the West is 650 CE when this project took place. But in fact, I think there's actually no reason to assume it took place during 650. We actually don't have enough detail to identify it at that level of resolution. I think the most confident, the, the most conservative thing we can say when we talk about Uthman is his reign. So it, this project took place, if it were to have taken place, somewhere between 644, I think, so 24 Hijri, uh, to 656. So sometime in that window, right? And then there's the aspect, the issue of, well, how do you understand, let's say, the date of the Birmingham manuscript in light of this? So if we were in a vacuum and we had no prior bias or belief or idea, and we just came upon this manuscript and we took a sample and we radiocarbon dated it, and we saw that it could live anywhere between you know, 600 or something like that. To yeah, I thought the dates went even earlier, uh, at least the initial report. It could be. So, I mean, yeah. it could be like... I don't remember the exact, so 579 to 645 is something in that range. So right. something, something I, I, in that yeah. range. I, I think it was 568 oh, yeah. to 645. Thank you. Yeah, so the one thing that changes these a little bit is the calibration curve. So the initial results were with this uh, IntCal 13, which was published in 2013. And then if you recalibrate it with IntCal 20, which was released in 2020, uh, I think that okay. they just a few years to the right, just Got a few it. years. Okay. Uh, but here's a key thing. So let's go through a thought experiment. So, uh, you know, let's say I, uh, um, I make the following statement. You know, uh, Gabriel Said Reynolds was a professor at the University of Notre Dame 
sometime between 1900 and 2100. All right, so I just gave you a window of time when you were a professor there. Now, that does not mean that you were a professor there during 2100 or 1900. It just means that you could have been a professor there at any point in time during that window. Or, or even 2000 or even the middle day. Oh, correct. It could be it could be anything, right? So I'm giving you a range of possibilities. So that's one thing to understand with radiocarbon dating is it gives a distribution, a probability distribution. And you, you can't just uh, you know split it in two and take the the average or median date and uh, come up with your answer. Yeah, correct. You absolutely cannot do that. Uh, number one, because the distributions are not uh, Gaussian, so they're not like bell shaped when you calibrate them. Uh, but number two, because um, the probability through radiocarbon dating of a uh, an object being from one year is infinitesimally small. So what you're interested in is when you want to ask probative questions, you're interested in the area under the curve. What is the likelihood or the probability that this, you know, let's say manuscript dates from before 650 or after 632? So you can ask questions like that and you can get percentages. You can, you know, you can get probabilities. The probability is 0 0.9, 0 0.8, or 90%, 80%. Those are the kinds of questions that one can ask. So to go back, to really start building up, I think, like fundamental uh, uh, building blocks, if all we had, we didn't know the context. No, we had no historical context for the Birmingham uh, fragment that was radiocarbon dated. We didn't even know what was on it. And we got that interval. We could, I mean, we could really say, well, you know, I think that this date is more likely, or I think that this date is more likely due to other factors, external factors that would influence our decision behind preferring a certain date range compared to another date range, right? So this is where external evidence comes, does affect how we interpret these results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other important thing- so you, to Just sorry to jump in there, but so so you would bring to bear the evidence of, uh, of the manuscripts themselves, of the reports and traditions themselves, of uh, critical reading of these akhbar or uh, a hadith uh, regarding the collection. Yeah, so one could, right? So one could. I'm not saying that you have to, but one could do that to bring that in. The other thing is to look at, well, you know, also the materiality. Uh, what can we, is there something that is, can we say something about the paleography or the orthography of this manuscript or even the art history? So there are, you know, these uh, ornament, there's ornamentation between the surahs and things like that, that will help uh, make uh, help us yeah. identify like a narrower region that yeah. we think so, is- And that's, that's generally known as paleography. So uh, probably there uh, goes beyond paleography since it's not simply the script because there are ornamental or illuminative aspects to uh, the um, the presentation of the text. But uh, yeah, okay, that's a really important point. I think Francois de Roche has explored that um, and along with other scholars. Yes. And the final thing I want to mention uh, on this uh, point specifically is we only have one test uh, that was carried out on the Birmingham fragment. And so every measurement is subject to noise. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are very interesting, so there are the, the wonderful thing is we can run simulations. We can do numerical experiments and say, well, let's hy hypothetically, let's suppose we have a manuscript that we know was you know, copied in the you know, year 650. Let's simulate what a result from a lab would look like with a given uncertainty that corresponds to that. And you can see some of them come out early and some of them come out late and things like that. But obviously, uh, as the number of samples increase, you should converge upon the true date associated with that within the bounds of the calibration curve and confidence and things like that as well. It, wasn't that uh, an issue with the dating of the Sena palimpsest as well, where different laboratories gave different results? Yeah, so that could be, uh, yes. So there are there is no measurement noise, but there are also outliers. Uh, okay. And these are wonderful questions. So to go back to our analogy of a thermometer, this has, I, I am certain this has happened to everyone watching this before. You take your temp, you stick the thermometer in, you take your temperature, the thing beeps and you look at it and it's like 95. You're like, that can't be true. So you take another measurement the second time and then it comes out 98.1 or something. So th it's the same thermometer, but for whatever reason, there could be a, a myriad of reasons that you took a measurement once and it came out and it was just unexplainably different from the other measurements. That's what we define as an outlier. Mm -hmm. And there are statistical tests we can carry out to identify outliers and use criteria to say, this is an outlier, and this is why it shouldn't be included in our average. Right, right. And I think if that, hopefully that, or standing on, on the scale, you're weighing yourself, hopefully mm -hmm. that experience everyone's kind of lived through, and whether the instrument you're using is, you know, $5 that you bought at the, you know, CVS, or multi, a multi-million dollar instrument, outliers happen uh, uh, 
Yeah. Exactly. With some frequency. Yeah. yeah. Super. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, it's interesting because the way the debate unfolds, um, and sometimes there are people uh, who know the science that are part of the debate and others who are not that are uh, trying to get into the scrum anyway. Uh, but um, the the way the debate unfolds is there are people who, for different reasons, uh, argue for a post Uthmanic date. Um, it, and, you know, maybe Abdel Malik or maybe Al Hajjaj in particular was involved for some reason. And so you see that, and I, that argument has been made on paleographic, because we're just speaking about paleographic grounds that this sort of text in light of what we know of the development of the Arabic script wouldn't have appeared until the late seventh century, uh, possibly early eighth century. Um, uh, there are other people who argue that the, the C14 dating, and I've made this point, actually points to something very, very early, you know, earlier than 650. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I, on other grounds, you know, I'm in the camp of a very early Quran, um, Fred Donner has made arguments about this as well, um, you know, in, in light of the, the nature of the early tafsir, uh, in their understanding of the transmission of the, Quran, the, of the Quranic text, in light of the language and the difference in language between hadith and Quran. Um, uh, and you've obviously argued in, uh, with the, trans the evidence of the, the transmission of the text in the manuscripts. Um, and one argument for people who want to push a later date is we have, uh, we have done carbon dating on certain manuscripts, which are later. I imagine they're Kufic, but you can correct me, um, that are actually are dated. So another important point to make is our Hejazi manuscripts are not dated. No one has written in a colophon or a little note at the end of the text. Uh, you know, I, Zaid, or whoever, Fulan, wrote this down in the year X. Um, but we do have later, uh, again, I think they're, they're Kufic, probably Abbasid Qurans, which do have those dates and which have been carbon dating. And I've read the point uh, that there's a discrepancy between the carbon dating and the actual date um, of uh, that's written down in the manuscript. Yeah, a lot of very interesting questions. So one, uh, so I, I think, some of these things can fall under the same umbrella, which is that of reporting. What I mean by that is there are certain standards or protocols that are uh, strongly advocated by, you know, in the radiocarbon dating community of how one should go about publishing these data. So when you carry out a determination, so a radiocarbon dating result, you publish that result, the lab it comes from, the lab reference, uh, the uncalibrated dates, what calibration curve you used. There's certain you know information that should be published when, uh, uh, along with uh, uh, a radiocarbon uh, determination and an interpretation. Right. I have tried my best uh, in some of those instances that you referenced to get my hands on the those data, but they are not available. They have not been published, okay. so I cannot speak about them because I don't know what the raw data look like. Okay. Right. And yeah. so, and when you read the discussion associated with it, it is an interpretation of the data, talking about the most probable date or this or things like that, which are not necessarily the most, not necessarily the most correct things to look at when you are trying to compare like a colophon or something like that or a waqf with the radio carbon date from manuscript. So I actually cannot speak about that data. What I can speak about are uh, uh, published data where we have the proper, you know, radiocarbon dating uh, uh, information published along with uh, the results. So, for example, under the auspices of the, of the Corpus Chronicum project, a, uh, a, a papyrus was dated. It is not Quranic material, but it's a dated papyrus to something like 714 CE. I don't remember the exact date, but it's part of, I think, the Qurra collection. Mm -hmm. And the radiocar it was uh, 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 dated, uh, and the radiocarbon date matched perfectly the date that mm -hmm. was written uh, on the piece of papyrus. So, and they, you know, they did their due diligence in terms of publishing all the information necessary for someone to uh, uh, critically analyze that, uh, that data. You see, so some, so that's also another issue is like something when someone reports something and just gives like calendar dates, uh, I, I, you know, I can't do much with that in terms of right. scrutinizing right. it or criticizing it right. Right. Uh, in any way because I don't have enough information right. available to me. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's one aspect. Um, the other aspect would be, um, you know, with the later dating and things like that. So, um, with with folks who who, who oh so uh, yeah so so folks who point to like a later date whether it's Abdelmenek or Hajjaj or etc. Um, this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about things being testable. So they, you know, in general, those discussions, they bring up certain uh, uh, concerns that are all valid. They're all valid concerns about the calibration curves, the uh, applicability of them to those manuscripts. You know, 
the time that might have gone between when the animal died and when the parchment was written on, all kinds of things. Those are all valid concerns. The, the thing is, they are testable. So we have, we can put bounds around the orders of magnitude associated with each of these effects, and we can say, does it change our conclusion? And what I'm hoping to present about at Iqsa, which is on the subject, is to show that when you look at all these effects, they still cannot, uh, you can still cannot reconcile, uh, you know, the later dating, uh, uh, proposed dating, so let's say the Abdelmedic Hajjaj time, like late seventh century, with some of the earliest dates that we have. But when you account for these effects, which again, are ve very valid concerns, everything fits in perfectly with, you know, the, or sometime around 650, or let's say during the reign of Uthman. So that's the key distinction, is that even by accounting for these different effects, uh, you are still looking at a, a, dis at a large discrepancy in terms of the date. So um, that's what I would say uh, say there.